of space exploration. Hello, I'm Al Hibbs at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and we're watching NASA's Voyager 2 on its encounter with the planet Uranus. This week, we're looking over the shoulders of Voyager scientists as they receive new information on Uranus and analyze it in its original form. We'll be discussing its significance, the mission's scientific goals, and what this encounter can teach us about our world and the universe. Today, Voyager 2 has traveled beyond Uranus and is looking back over its shoulder at the receding planet its satellites, and its rings. At 5 p.m., Voyager was 2,544,000 miles beyond Uranus and on a course for Neptune at 33,178 miles an hour. The Voyager's en route now to Neptune, its encounter with Uranus has not ended. We will continue to make observations of this intriguing planet for about one more month. Closest approach occurred on Friday. The pictures taken then were not fed back at that time, though they were stored in the spacecraft's tape recorder and have been coming in since then. So let's take a look at some of them. Dr. Ed Stone, who's the Voyager project scientist, is with me now. And uh, the most intense period of our encounter with Uranus is almost at an end, but the encounter continues. Voyager 2 is continuing to look back and take data. And Ed, while this continues, uh, what do you, how would you summarize what we've seen, well, particularly today? This has been the most exciting one. It certainly has been the most exciting day, and uh, I think certainly the highlight has been the images, uh, the close-up images of the satellites uh, in orbit around, uh, around Uranus. I think we have some of those available here, and why don't we try to uh, get some of them called up and... Uh we just saw one. Here is a <clears throat> reasonable... Uh close-up of one of Ariel, but the one we really want, I think, is Miranda. That's Miranda, yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. I think the thing which uh, surprised uh, most of us was not that Miranda necessarily had all these tectonic structures uh, on the surface, but that there was such a variety uh, that it was really a very complex distribution. Uh, and uh, I think the other thing that surprised me was the extreme relief uh, which uh, which seems to be present on the surface. It's not a very subtle uh, property at all. One sees very very sharp scarps, uh, ridges. One sees uh, groove terrain. One sees terrain similar to that which we saw on Enceladus, which is somewhat twisted. It's just a remarkably complex surface. And uh, the, are those cliffs up at the top? Those are very high cliffs, which uh, uh, which are quite remarkable. Uh, they they terminate a very rugged, uh, hilly terrain, uh, which uh, uh, may well be a place where there is a, a basically lateral thrusting. And uh, down at the lower portion of the planet, well, this planet we call it a planet. It looks like yes, one, that's it? right. Uh, this moon, Uranus. We saw we see again some of the same curious lines that are going. That's through. right. That's right. Fractures. This the surface has been heavily fractured uh, by some sort of processing. Uh, there may well be some layering on it in, uh, in the lower right-hand uh, portion of this image where one sees uh, these alternating dark and lighter right streaks. And that's here. right. Uh, perhaps that's layering of material. It's really a remarkably complex surface for an object that's barely 300 miles in diameter. And this is a picture that we had up earlier. And uh, again, with this in this region yes. here, that's a groove terrain, which is quite reminiscent of the terrain that we found uh, on Ganymede quite extensively. It was a terrain that separated the older, darker parts of the crust on Ganymede. And this one, <clears throat> with a curious thrusting of material yes. dark That's here right. into a lighter group here. That's it right. looks it's like uh, the kind of almost like tectonic activity you might expect on Earth, certainly. Yes, well, well, linear fractures, like uh, it's just remarkable that this small object has such a variety of, of such uh, forms on its surface. And of course, there is an area there which is just ancient, heavily cratered, uh, rather nondescript surface. And this is a piece of the, of, the, of the feature we were seeing before. It curves around in a large, rather large square, it covers yes, quite a bit of time. That's right, that's right. And here's another one. Yeah, now this is now Ariel, uh, and it shows also a remarkable amount of relief. 
Uh, again, uh, it, it appears as though there were fault lines uh, which intersected and uh, there seemed to be valleys and perhaps uh, uh, material on the valley floor. Not as, not as dramatic as Miranda, it's a little bit further from Uranus. Whether that has anything to do with the, the, uh, the degree of, uh, of activity on the surface is not yet clear, but it is true that Miranda is by far the most complex surface. We've looked at a lot of uh, moons over the time that uh, we've been flying Voyager through the solar system. We've seen some rather odd things like uh, Mimas near Saturn with that huge crater mm -hmm. in the middle of it. And uh, volcanoes on Io probably. Were, yeah. were, it's not likely we're going to see anything quite that spectacular. No, I think again. that's right. But for geologic uh, confusion and fascination, I think this is the one. I think this must be the prize, yes. We also saw something else I'd like to bring up here if I can find the right uh, picture for it. Maybe I can't. It's, uh, yeah, let me try to get this one up on our, on our still story. It just came in today, and with any luck, I will be able to... Uh, no, I'm not having any luck. But at any rate, it showed the rings. But now backlighted. Yes, backlighted. And they were, uh, the dust we've been looking for all along is now there. That's right. We did manage to take one exposure, 96 seconds long, with the wide-angle camera, and that was enough of an exposure that this very faint dust material just appeared in this image. And uh, was, it the, was it the length of the exposure? I believe it was, because we had shorter exposure, 15 or 16 second exposures, yeah, I, where, where, where there was just no, no evidence of the material. Yeah, it was quite a disappointment for a while. We expected mm -hmm. dust to be there, now here it is. That's but, right. But now that we see it, we don't know quite how to understand well, it. It'll take a while to understand the complex. Out completely. That's right. What about the rest of the things? The magnetic field is still... Uh, well, we, I think uh, we're learning more about the magnetic field. We've learned that uh, there is indeed a trapped radiation environment. It's, uh, uh, there's enough, uh, there are enough trapped protons there that if there is methane on the surface of any of these satellites, it will be turned black, you know, in, in the order of a hundred years. We're seeing and that may account color. for some of it, yes. Thank you very much, Ed. And, uh, now I want to point out that the encounter with Uranus is indeed almost over. The encounter continues, though. Voyager 2 is looking back at Uranus to take data, and Bill Griffith is in the spaceflight operations watching the progress of the encounter. That's right, the people here in the Spaceflight Operations Facility are only one small part of the effort to keep Voyager 2 doing the job it was sent to do. We shouldn't all forget those people who are not on camera every day. Voyager, like any space project, is a team effort. And when this encounter is over late next month, Voyager will be on its way to an encounter with Neptune, of course, the eighth planet from the sun. And these people you're seeing here will still be here keeping an eye on their spacecraft. Voyager's Neptune encounter will bring the planetary exploration program to the end of its first major phase, that being the initial reconnaissance of the solar system. But there are certainly more projects. There's Galileo to spend almost two years orbiting Jupiter. Ulysses will explore the poles of the sun. And a new spacecraft called Mars Observer will return to the red planet. Then there'll be a project named Magellan to go to Venus to map its cloud-hidden surface with radar. While we've learned so much from the Mariners and the Vikings and the Voyagers, we still have a lot to learn. And the people who fly these spacecraft, as well as the scientists who reap so much from the data we get, are our teachers. The Rings of Uranus have some provided some thrills and surprises for several of Voyager scientists those who specialize in studying planetary rings. One of those is Dr. Jeff Cuzzy from NASA's Ames Research Center, and he's with me now. And just let's talk about these strange rings, and I'm going to ask that somebody can to put up on, uh, the, on one of our video ports 70, this picture we want. Vic, could you do that? We're trying to get 7761 to take a look at. Uh, Jeff, the rings have been, well, we knew about that they were there before before Voyager got there, but uh, we've discovered quite a bit more about them, and particularly about the detailed structures since we've been there. What can you say about them? Well, uh, you know, the main rings of Uranus Alibur were known from stellar occultations. Uh, several of us who think about rings tend to associate small objects, debris, if you like, of uh, were left over from the formation of the moons and the planet that are associated with rings. When you have all this debris around, with the impacting meteoroids that are always there, 
you always expect to have dust. Now, this dust is very short-lived because it drags into the planet, it gets destroyed by the magnetic field, spread away one thing or another. So the location of the dust is a very important tracer of where the material is. And so we were uh, very uh, eagerly anticipating the existence of uh, the structure of the dust. Now, because of the magnetic field, uh, and probably because of the, uh, the perturbing effect of the magnetic field on the charged particles that are small, most of the dust seems to have been removed from the Uranus system. But in the latest images that have come down, which are at the very highest phase angles, that is the, the smallest deviation of the sunlight from the direction in which it came. Almost okay. right, looking almost into the sun. Almost into the sun, and that's how these small particles scatter the strongest. And this so, is a picture we got at that point. Yeah, that is an absolutely spectacular picture, and it shows basically that most of the region uh, of the known rings is, uh, is more or less replete with dust, uh, and the density of the dust varies, and we have all these fluctuations in the brightness. These uh, marks here, are those starlight stars shining through? Yeah, those are stars that are smeared. This, uh, this observation was taken simultaneously with the radio occultation of the planet, and so we carefully designed these images so that the smear of the spacecraft would be right along the rings. And, uh, in fact, this, uh, the left-hand side of the image is essentially unsmeared for this reason. The... Uh, uh the, the position of this dust, is it, how well correlated is it with the other rings? Are we seeing the, the main rings through the dust? Or do you uh, know uh, somewhere in there we're seeing the main rings, and uh, we're working on that right now. I, I wouldn't say that the correlation is, is outstanding. There's just so much stuff there, and as you know, the main rings, there's nine of them, and uh, there, this, this region is, is completely Enormous filled with structure. dust of yeah. various uh, uh, density, and so there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on here that we're, we're just going to have to think about. I, uh, when we were talking earlier about the magnetic field having a major effect on small dust particles because they get electric charge and then they're subject to make electromagnetic forces, this wobbling magnetic field you would anticipate it would throw the dust completely out of the system. And yet here it seems to simply have smeared it out in the plane. Well, it, uh, it does throw it, uh, it, it decreases its density, let's say that, because not all of the bigger dust particles will respond less readily to the magnetic field perturbations. So basically, we're just seeing a depletion of the dust. You can rinse your glass as often as you like. You're always going to leave something behind. Uh -huh. And this is what we're seeing. The density of this material is considerably less than what we saw at Saturn. Oh, uh, I see. In, in the main rings, OK? This is certainly more than we see in the G ring and the E ring and the very, very faint rings. But it's there. It's less than we thought, but it's there. Jeff, thank you very much. OK. Reporters from around the world are here to cover Voyager's flight. Bill Griffith was on hand for today's press briefing. Voyager scientists put on quite a show at today's press briefing, and satellite Miranda was clearly the star. Larry Soderblom of the imaging team displayed the very high-resolution photos that Voyager took of it on Friday, showing a surprisingly wide variety of geologic features groups of canyons and cracks and craters suggesting a violent formation process. Soderblom said that these and other photos are helping them understand more about the formation of the Iranian satellites. Oberon, um, we didn't see a lot of uh, evidence of tectonism. Titania, we start to see uh, more evidence. I'll skip over Umbriel. We'll try to work on that one tomorrow. Uh, as it's a different story related to its, uh, its albedo that we've mentioned. Moving on in, Ariel shows a great deal more uh, geologic activity. There was also new information about the rings, including this photo showing clear evidence of the newest ring discovered. And Dr. Lonnie Lane showed tentative evidence of other formations within the ring complex, including tiny strands of ring material measuring as small as 10 to 50 meters across. There was also possible answers about why the satellites and rings are so dark. It seems the methane ice in them may be interacting with what scientists are finding to be an overabundance of high-energy protons. Yesterday, scientists said they had found that Uranus's magnetic field does not correspond to its rotational axis, that in fact it is tilted at a 55-degree angle from the axis. Today, they said some of the satellites orbiting within that magnetic field may be scraping bits and pieces of it away. 
Finally, there was even an audio presentation today. Plasma Wave investigator Fred Scarf played a recording of dust particles hitting Voyager's electronic microphone as the spacecraft crossed the ring plane from as far away as 68,000 miles. It showed evidence of a vast number of dust particles even at that distance from the planet. With the day's press briefing, I'm Bill Griffith. We've been talking mostly about Uranus, its satellites, its rings, magnetic environment, what we call the Uranian system. And our Voyager scientists are beginning to compare the Uranian system with other systems. And so Gary Hunt of the Voyager imaging team has joined me now to help us put Uranus into its perspective, the proper one, with Voyager's other targets. And Gary? Uh, what the, the other targets, certainly, that we have to compare it with are the big gas balls, Jupiter, Saturn. There's a whole point of this uh, exploration, the other solar system. We can now compare Uranus, tipped on its side, heated so much less than Jupiter and, and Saturn, and have a look at its weather systems, see how they compare. When we look at the first pictures that we've actually got, the very first image looks very bland on the left-hand mm -hmm. side. This one here. And in fact, you can see very little information. It does look terribly exciting. But when you start to bring out the detail using some of the color filtered images that we have, you can start to see that looking at the South Pole, that is the one we're flying toward, there does seem to be some form of banding around the atmosphere of, um, of, of Uranus itself. You can see, in fact, here going from the, the polar region out towards the lower latitudes. So there do seem to be bands present. Mm -hmm. So Uranus at first sight does have a banded appearance. It's worth, in fact, comparing. If we could look back at Jupiter, just a second, and have a, have a, to see what that would look like if we look from the poles. This is the view that we have got, taking together the previous data from Voyager. Again, you can see how the bands would look if you we were flying towards the poles of Jupiter. So we are, really do have a banded planet relative to the rotational axis. And even Saturn, when we looked at Saturn with Voyager, if you look at the next picture, you will... We might point out the little black spot in the middle right here isn't that's an example of spot that's right because we weren't <laughs> flying that way to remind you we were flying around the equator and that's we never the part, got pictures of that's the part we never saw pole. but when we look at saturn then the, the appearance there is once more a banded planet and the bands in fact are here here are the bands in this sort of direction rotation, rotational axis down here so in fact the the, the the band in fact is sort of perpendicular to the axis of rotation so we're in a position now to sort of summarize the way in which the the planets now look in fact, it is that the rotation of the planet that in fact organizes the flow. And if you look at the, the summary picture that one can view, then in fact you can see that here with all the planets that we've seen, from Venus to the Earth, through Jupiter to Saturn, and now Uranus, all with very different axes of rotation. But it is the spin and that tilt that organizes the flow. Not the sun hitting it. Under one Not so much the sun hitting it. So in that aspect, Uranus really is banded. That is a very significant discovery. Exactly why it's banded, we're not really sure in the sense of how the cells mix together. But the rotation has organized it, uh, you can see, perpendicular to the axis of rotation. But here the difference then is Uranus and, of course, the way the weather systems are driven. About a four hundredth of the energy that reaches the Earth finally gets to Uranus. Very weak uh, sunlight. But in fact, we are seeing cloud elements there. When we look up here to these lower latitudes, this is looking down towards the equator, we are in fact seeing clouds. Now these sort of cloud systems probably are methane clouds, convective storms. And this particular one we've seen for more than 200 hours, a very long-lived feature. And in fact, it, it looks very much, in fact, like the plumes that we saw around the equatorial region of Jupiter. So in fact, what we're seeing is that the storm systems that we've seen on the Earth, that we've now seen on Jupiter, on Saturn, we're seeing on Uranus. And although this, this planet is covered in a haze layer, it has got an active meteorology, strong weather systems, even though it would seem that the sunlight is very weak and even, even the internal heat, heat source is of a different magnitude than we've seen from, from its other companions, Jupiter and Saturn. And the heat source for Jupiter certainly included its own, the heat that Jupiter itself is putting That's out. That's right. Now, this is one of the observations we're expecting to obtain at any day now, where we'll be measuring the total sunlight the planet uh, is reflecting, compared with that it emits. We understand the energy that the planet, therefore, has intrinsically, compared to that it's radiating away. We we'll know just how strong that internal heating is. 
Now, if there isn't a very strong internal heating and this weak sunlight, perhaps we have a slightly decoupled system from the, the deep interior compared to the meteorological systems. And we may have a, a weather system rather akin to the thin uh, models that we tend to use to explain the Earth. But this is, really has been an exciting encounter, perhaps not terribly many cloud features, but many that's given us a good idea of what the weather on Uranus is doing. Gary, thank you very much for joining us. Until the dawn of the space age, astronomers were the scientists who studied the planets. But since then, people who pursue many scientific disciplines have spent their time working on planetary exploration. But astronomers are still in the middle of the action, and Karen Long talked with one of those astronomers, Dr. Rita Beebe, about Uranus. False color global photographs of Uranus are enabling imaging scientists to track weather features and map wind fields on the planet. Astronomer Rita Beebe's been studying this whitish streak across the top of the picture. She says it's the first time in history we're actually able to see clouds at Uranus. How do you know it's a cloud? Because it's free moving. There is another one which will appear on the limb and follow around here. And the two clouds are separating from each other in time. So that this cannot be rotating like a solid body. There has to be winds in this planet that vary from the equator to the pole of the planet. Now that little cloud formation at the top of Uranus looks relatively harmless. How big would that be? This dimension across here is about a, a thousand kilometers or about 600 miles. These are equivalent to cloud systems here on Earth. When you listen to the weather report and they're showing a large mass of clouds that are coming in off of the Pacific and moving across the country, those are large systems. They're a, a thousand kilometers across easily. So that what we have is we have an in, entire convective system that is being sheared in the wind and we're tracing it. According to Professor Beebe, the cloud is formed from methane. The visible cloud deck is actually so cold it's methane ice. There are apparently similar clouds all over the planet. In this picture, however, pinkish hazes, or fog banks, are prohibiting deeper views into the atmosphere. Uranus is apparently much like Jupiter and Saturn in that its atmospheric conditions are dictated by the rotation of the planet. Yet we find the weather conditions at Uranus are quite unique. Scientists have not detected any excess heat coming from Uranus, the kind of heat that contributes to violent atmospheric conditions like the stormy great red spot at Jupiter. I'm Karen Long. Voyager's many scientists specialize in specific aspects of exploration. The planet itself, its rings, its satellites. And one of those who specializes in the satellites of Uranus is Bob Brown. David Sparks caught up with Bob while he was studying some of the latest Voyager pictures. One of the things that uh, I found most striking about Oberon uh, are these two craters which have uh, very dark floors. That is, the, <clears throat> the interior area of the craters uh, are quite dark. The exterior area is uh, quite bright. Uh, we've had uh, very little time to think about this, but uh, one particular scenario that we have been able to come up with is that this perhaps represents flooding of the crater floor subsequent to the crater formation of some kind of dark material, probably water ice mixed with, uh, with something that makes it dark. Uh, I guess might be carbon, but of course that's a little speculation at this point. So this suggests to us that, uh, at least in some sense, Oberon hasn't been a dead body for its entire existence, uh, that it perhaps might have had some geological activity in the uh, distant past. The other thing that you can see here, which uh, I thought was quite interesting, is that there's a small little pip on the limb of Oberon here. Now, it looks small in this image, but is a, it is, in fact, a mountain which is about six kilometers high, or about uh, 3.6 miles. Fascinating stuff, but how about for a person that isn't quite as familiar with all of this stuff, answering this question, why do these satellites all appear as though they are almost perfectly symmetrically round? Well, uh, that's primarily as a result of two things, their size and the fact that gravity acts in a symmetrical way. That is, after you have enough mass, <coughs> excuse me, enough mass uh, in a small enough space, uh, the thing will tend to crush 
uh, as of its own, because of its own weight. And because gravity acts symmetrically, it tends to form the thing into a sphere. So these objects are large enough and made of a material that's deformable enough so you can expect them to be spherical. The lower limit of size for an object like this uh, before you expect it to start to get irregular is about 500 kilometers in diameter or about 300 miles. Below that, there's not enough mass to deform the material so that it can form into a spherical shape. And so we expect perhaps that some of the smaller satellites of Uranus, for instance, uh, 1985 U1, is irregularly shaped because it's only about 150 to 100 kilometers in size, as near as we can estimate. For a little more on those satellites, Larry Soderblom, the deputy imaging team leader, has joined me. Larry, we, we have an enormous number of questions that have come up, particularly with regard to the close-ups of Miranda. How are we doing about finding some answers? Well, we're working on them. The, um, the Miranda image has really surprised us. Uh, an object uh, this small, this remote, out in the cold reaches of the solar system, uh, presumably made largely of ices, some rocky materials, that shows this uh, bizarre collection of geologic activity uh, is was beyond our wildest uh, expectations. Um, what we uh, see is a composite of a variety of geologic styles, unlike what we've seen on any planet so far in the solar system, actually including the Earth. Yeah, this, uh, this thing up here, which looks like a, a bed, a bunch of blankets piled one on top of it. Right, area. it does. Right. That's the impression I get as well, is that it looks like a, uh, imagine a, a set of playing cards in which each card is a little smaller than one below it. So you build up a, a tabloid of these, uh, and uh, you imagine, or another way to describe it is sort of rectangular crepes mm. stacked up, and they're kind of floppy. When you get the stack made up, you slap it on the side of Miranda, and that's... Uh, but you, you, we're getting different colored crepes here. There's, there's some white. There's, there's some white. White layer, black dark. layer, white layer. Well, we know that the uh, satellites uh, of Saturn and uh, uh, Uranus, as well as uh, a number of the asteroids, show a variety of bright, dark materials. And uh, their origin's uncertain. Uh, carbon is uh, thought to be a predominant agent virtually in all of the uh, scenarios to, de to explain the dark materials. The bright materials, uh, we've suggested uh, a variety of ices. Uh, in the case of uh, Mars, it was carbon dioxide ices, mm -hmm. Io, sulfur dioxide, here, pricing water ice. Methane's been suggested, but it's also been uh, shown that it should be pretty dark. It may mm -hmm. be the dark, darkest ice of all, meth could be methane here. But the, if, if this is so, the, there's not only some interesting geologic activity pushing the surface around, but there seems to be some sort of differentiation among the ices. That's right. The, uh, particularly in this layered uh, patch, uh, we don't know uh, where it, uh, how it originated. There are a number of models that the imaging team is beginning to work, uh, work on. Um, and here's this one here, which has some very enormous cliffs. Oh, yeah. Down here. How, how can those, those are incredible. Out? Well, you see here that, uh, um, let's see if I can get this triggered here. Along here, you'll see a series of uh, linear fault systems all the way through this region here. One of them, at this point, tears open, generating a series of cliffs. For those of you that are familiar with uh, Rim Rock Country in the, out in the west, you can imagine walking along that Rim Rock right there. Uh, down is into the screen. Uh, that may well be several miles Enormous vertical drop. Enormously steep cliff. Enormously steep cliff to uh, get up and down. Basically, uh, this whole object has been uh, torqued and sheared. Another thing interesting in this uh, particular picture here is the boundary between this uh, train, which is very lineated, and this sort of rolling mm -hmm. train over mm -hmm. here. And then, and then down, uh, down in this region, the, this sort of jabbing its way up into like right. it was almost a tectonic. Right. Place. There's an intersection here between two linear tectonic systems. One of them is highlighted by uh, this bright material down in this region. Probably uh, one of these volatiles, methane, ammonia, water ice, leaking out into the uh, near surface materials uh, and forming frost deposits. Over here, we see 
uh, a variety of very uh, rolling, irregular, sinuous uh, cliffs. The best model for that is what we saw in the planet Mercury, and that is that the uh, crust has been compressed. Most of these features that we see are and due to the, tension. And we're seeing only one picture of the whole group here. Oh, the, one, one of the group, yeah. Larry, There's thank you very much for joining us. All right, thank you. We've been showing you around a lot of the territory here at JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where we explore the planets for a living. But someone asked just the other day, what, what's JPL and how did it get involved in space exploration? Well, Bill Griffiths talked with a couple of people at JPL who know quite a bit about the lab's history. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory is nestled in the hills around Pasadena, California, just a few miles from the city's other famous landmark, the Rose Bowl. JPL's roots go back to this wash. This is the Arroyo Seco wash located just east of JPL. It was back in 1936 when a group of graduate students at Caltech, under the direction of Professor Theodore von Karman, successfully launched the first liquid fuel rocket motor. That was the beginning of JPL and, in effect, the beginning of the American space program. But JPL chief technologist Terry Cole says that original experiment almost didn't happen. They were afraid that they weren't going to make it, actually, because of a lack of about $120 for spare parts, which they later, they did scrounge up in Los Angeles. Uh, there is an apocryphal rumor that the money was won in a poker game, but no one knows whether that's really true or not. Uh, as it turned out, they did fire their first test on the 31st of October, 1936. The government began formal sponsorship of those students' rocket research in 1939, and then the Jet Propulsion Laboratory itself was formally started in November of 1944. JPL went on to work for the military during World War II on projects ranging from rocket-assisted airplane takeoffs to long-range guided missiles. And then along came the space age, when JPL got involved in the Explorer 1 project, and the lab's long-standing relationship with NASA was born. JPL director, Dr. Lou Allen. Even during those very early days, uh, JPL was asked to take the lead in certain interplanetary investigations. The earliest pioneer spacecraft, which escaped the Earth's gravitational field and proceeded on past the moon, uh, were done by JPL. The original programs were, were the Mariner programs, which investigated uh, Venus and Mercury and, uh, and Mars, and then that later led to a very comprehensive investigation of Mars, uh, which was the Viking program, in which JPL was responsible for that spacecraft. And JPL's work in space is far from over. Following this Voyager mission and the so-called Year of Space Science, with Ulysses to the Sun and Galileo to Jupiter, there is a planned mission to Venus in 1988 and one to Mars in 1990. I'm Bill Griffith. One of the moments in this encounter that held special fascination for many of Voyager's scientists was the instant when Voyager 2 crossed the plane in which Uranus rings lie. Karen Long was there with Rich Terrell, and the pictures from that moment arrived at JPL. This is the first of four images taken by Voyager 2 right at ring plane crossing. Although it looks upside down, this was actually Voyager 2's orientation while making the five second exposure. We're no longer seeing full circles, but looking closely at the curve of the rings, the so-called ANSA. We spoke with imaging scientist, Dr. Richard Terrell. What we have in this image is the, uh, the Epsilon ring, the broadest and brightest of the rings, and uh, one of the first of the known rings, the previously known rings, the Delta ring over here. Uh, we announced yesterday that we discovered a new ring between the Delta and the Epsilon rings. And actually, if you really uh, tilt your head a little bit and look very hard, you can just see hints of it um, between the two. In fact, we can use a, a technique called uh, uh, false color to, uh, to try to bring that out. And I'm not sure this will help, but uh, it certainly enhances the, uh, the epsilon ring. Right here, you can just start to see this new ring. How wide across would that new ring be? And why wasn't it detected from the ground during a star occultation? Well, there is evidence in at least one occultation that something was detected there. It's a very, very uh, tenuous ring. That is, it doesn't block out very much of the starlight. It's, uh, it's thin and transparent. Uh, our indications are that it's, I don't know what the exact measurement is, but it's do it does have uh, a finite width to it. It's probably several tens of kilometers wide. And uh, one of the things we're really interested in looking at is if the ring is continuous. Does it go all the way around, 
or are there breaks in it? Since it does exist in an area near a shepherding satellite, it's probably a very disturbed ring. It probably has quite a lot of perturbations in it and may even be a partial arc. And that would be quite unusual, wouldn't it? Yes, it would be. And we, However, we did find rings like that in the Saturn ring system, and we also think the Neptune rings are like that. So this might be a preview of what we might find at Neptune. And how could a ring be discontinuous? Well, it's a, it's a complicated dynamical issue, but basically it involves the action of uh, shepherding satellites nearby, disturbing the ring material and uh, concentrating it in certain parts of the orbit. What new insights are we getting from this particular picture on the rings? Well, we've got our first information on the, on the real structure at high resolution, the distribution across the orbit of the rings, uh, discovery of tenuous material within the rings, We've got color information on the rings, which indicates they may be, in fact, uh, different material or have different color properties. And uh, all together... What colors? What colors? Well... We've uh, always heard they're charcoal black and nothing else. Charcoal black, but they do have uh, certain tinges to them. And we don't know whether the tinge is uh, one ring being red and the other being blue or, or what, but uh, at least one ring is a very, very different color. Was there any concern that as Voyager 2 was making its ring plane crossing that it might encounter some wild ring particles that are out beyond the known rings. Absolutely. In fact, it's a very valid concern. We cross well outside these known rings. However, there, are, there is ground-based data to indicate there are rings between, for instance, the, the, the moon Miranda and Ariel. Uh, fortunately, there was no ground-based data to uh, detect any material um, in the area that Voyager was, uh, was crossing the ring plane, so we felt pretty confident, but it's, it's always a concern. We always keep our fingers crossed at the moment for ring plane crossing. Imaging scientists will be carefully studying the new pictures in the coming weeks and months, looking for tiny shepherd satellites not immediately visible and other peculiarities within the rings. I'm Karen Long. And shortly after Voyager crossed the ring plane, it flew behind Uranus, and at that point, the team called Radio Science went into action. So that was their big moment when the radio signal from Voyager began to penetrate the atmosphere of Uranus. We've been hanging around the radio science team for just about a week now as they have waited for their big event to arrive, the occultation. And that's when Voyager 2 disappears from Earth's view behind the planet Uranus. Well, finally, the moment of truth has arrived. <laughs> That's it. That's something, all right. Well, we're actually right at this very minute, right in the middle of the uh, ring system. We've uh, seen a radio occultation of six rings, and I guess we're waiting for the three more rings to see. We're on the ingress period. We're, we're going in. We've still got the atmospheric occultation to go, and we've got the rings to see coming out. So it's, we've seen the signature in the downlink power signal, and uh, it's really exciting. Don Sweetnam is a member of the radio science team and was kind enough to talk with us as the occultation was in progress. There were some very tense moments at the start. Well, I think we started out a little shaky, but boy, we picked up now and the recorders are going fine. We're getting the data. We're seeing the signatures. Uh, we were a little bit uh, worried whether we'd see things, and they're there. So we're really excited. Obviously, we, here we go. We got another one. All this is exciting for you guys, but tell us lay people, what are we learning from this? Well, we're going to learn about uh, just exactly where the rings are about Uranus. We're going to learn how big the rings are, uh, the size of the particles in the rings, um, we're going to learn about the atmosphere. We're going to actually find out what the temperature is down in the uh, atmosphere, what the pressure is, whether it's... Uh, uh, well, we know it's very cold. We're going to know exactly how cold it is. From JPL's radio science team, I'm David Sparks. And now Len Tyler of the radio science team has joined me in the Blue Room. Len, it's uh, been an exciting couple of days, particularly uh, with that passage behind Uranus and the occultation. What sort of results do you have so far? Well, they, the results are just beginning to come in. Uh, in some ways, we sort of follow behind the rest of the project in terms of uh, when we are in the timeline. So we're just now beginning to receive and get well into the process of analyzing our data. But we have some preliminary results on ring particle sizes. We're beginning to uh, uh, make good progress on the inversion of the atmospheric occultation data. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're working on the gravity uh, field of of uh, Uranus uh, using the tracking data. So there's three main areas in which we are involved. Okay, and th these are the stations that are involved in this whole operation here on Earth, huh? Well, the other uh, 10 Voyager investigations all have uh, experiments that are bolted to the spacecraft and carried into space. But uh, our instrument is on the ground. And uh, in the case of this uh, observation, it was uh, located in the Australian Capital Territory, a place called Tidbinbilla, 
This is a, a picture of the antennas. Uh, I should mention there was a, a, also an antenna at Parks near there, near Tidbinbella, uh, 100 or 200 kilometers to the north, that was also used. And uh, this is a diagram of uh, the way in which the beam goes through the interesting things around Uranus. It's the same back toward Earth, which is, let me see a little bit more of that. Mm -hmm. The beam is aimed down toward Earth, and as the spacecraft goes by, it illuminates various portions of it. Yes, well, that's the other part of our instrument, is the uh, spacecraft itself, and specifically the spacecraft telecommunication system. We use the radio transmitters uh, on the spacecraft as a source of, of energy, uh, which is used to probe first the rings, uh, then the atmosphere, then finally rings again of uh, Uranus. And this is a diagram of the amount of, of how the power, you, uh, the power would change as it flies behind. Yes, if you were looking from the Earth, you would see uh, uh, Voyager flying from right to left behind Uranus along this track. And uh, the red circle with the uh, blue dot represents the size of the radio beam at each instant in time. And here's the way the beam actually, the beam actually circles around. Yes, for the, atmos you look at it. For the atmospheric part of the occultation, uh, the beam, even though the spacecraft is directly behind the planet, the radio beam follows a refractive path uh, through the atmosphere to the Earth. Uh, and, and that is the, is the signal going through the atmosphere that then gives us some understanding of the nature it, and the part of the It atmosphere. gives us a very sensitive probe of the atmosphere based on the same, same effect we see at sunset where the rays of the sun in the Earth's atmosphere are bent. Right. Thank you very much, man. Okay. <clears throat> For all the scientists gathered here at JPL, these are exciting moments as the pictures and other data continue to come down from Voyager. They're also challenging moments as we study the information and analyze it. Being, but seeing uh, Uranus as we are now is one thing. Getting Voyager 2 there was another. That task was equally remarkable and challenging. Dr. Don Gray is our navigation team chief, and George Fenneman talked with him about that feat. Don, you brought, brought the um, spacecraft from Earth to Jupiter to Saturn and Uranus. My question is, how in the world do you do that? Because it, it, it's, it's getting there. I mean, it's, it's doing it. How? It's an interesting problem because Uranus is a unique challenge for navigation. It's the most difficult navigation one we've ever faced. First of all, we're coming in on it like a flat disk. It looks like a bullseye. Mm -hmm. And that means all the optical pictures that we take are just seeing a flat plate. They're, they don't see any uh, depth. And so they're not able to determine when we're going to get there. And it's the same idea with our radio data. We're coming in extremely rapidly, about 10 miles every second. And uh, we will have come in, we've come in, you know, that rapidly. And now, of course, we're by the encounter. But uh, that means that our radio data, too, did not sense the gravity field of the planet until very late in the encounter. A week before the encounter, we didn't know to the nearest minute when we'd be there. Hmm. Uh, now that we've passed the encounter, we know to the nearest second. That it, it boggles my mind, because I have trouble, you know, finding the off-ramp on the freeway to get here today. Mm. Um, how do you do that, though? You, 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 what do you do mm. to make it work? Yes, the accuracy with which we do this encounter is more like taking a dart, throwing it here in Los Angeles, and hitting a fly in New York City. <laughs> so it's extremely accurate. And we use a combination of radio data and optical data. The radio data are sent up from the Earth, mm -hmm. and then the spacecraft turns right back around and sends it back to us. So we can see the Doppler shift in that radio data, just like you would a train coming toward you, you know, the whistle sounds higher in pitch and then goes on by you. But, you know, we're so far away that it takes the radio signal five and a half hours just to go out to the spacecraft and back. And now it's winter time on the spacecraft, just as it is here. And that means the length of the day is shorter. So a typical tracking pass from one of our big antennas in the northern hemisphere is only about eight hours. And we lose five and a half of that just for the radio data to get there and back. Very limited in the amount of data that we can get. And uh, we really have to make the best use of it. How many people are responsible for navigating a, a shot like this? Sir? Well, it depends on how wide a net you want to. We have three people who are the overall navigation strategists with a fourth expert thrown in for good measure. Then we have about four people who are specialists in optical data, 
And then several more of us who, after we've de estimated what orbit we're on, try to determine how best to get on the one we want to be on. You know, it's like we just missed the ramp. Now <laughs> how do we best get to Uranus? But you did it. And it's, it's marvelous. And I, I, again, I don't understand quite how it is done. But thank goodness you're here. <laughs> it's an exciting thing. We have a mature team. Some of us have been together since before launch. Oh. We've been building a championship team for eight years now. And not only that, you know, it's kind of like there's an excitement because it's like being on Magellan's uh, crew or Christopher Columbus' crew. We're part of the group that's doing this. And, you know, when our grandchildren come and ask us, what did you do? You can say, I was part of exploring the outer reaches of the solar system. And I can say, I talked to him, you know. <laughs> Don, it's been a pleasure. <laughs> Thank I'm you, George. George Fenneman. Getting there is only half the fun. Studying that strange planet is the other half. And one of those who's having so much fun is Ken Behannon of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Ken is a member of the Magnetic Field Investigation. He's with me now. And Ken, your instrument has uh, turned up some extremely different measurements than what we anticipated. Yes, I must say that we were not only surprised but elated because uh, we literally did not know what to expect when we came into uh, Uranus. And uh, so the first uh, indication that there was a strong magnetic field uh, to say the least, made us all excited and very happy. And then to go on and see that it's a very unusual field uh, was another part of it that uh, provided additional excitement. I guess the, one of the most surprising things was the way the axis of the main magnetic dipole is, is, or is, is arranged. Yes, if you look down, if, if this was in a vacuum, if Uranus was in a vacuum and you had a, a simple bar magnet there, uh, it would have this kind of configuration. and. Uh, with the rotation axis uh, going this way, sort of in the direction of the sun, the magnetic axis is oriented to 55 degrees to that axis, and that's uh, much larger than anything else seen in any other uh, axis orientation seen in the solar system, and has uh, substantial uh, implications not only for the total magnetic environment around Uranus, but for the uh, interior structure, which I'm sure people would be working on in the next mm -hmm. few years. Mm -hmm. That seems to be so much. Our own magnetic axis on the Earth is, of course, tilted a little bit. Yes, it's only about 10 degrees. Now, uh, as I said, this is like uh, in a vacuum. If you have uh, this put now in its, its actual environment with the solar wind coming in, the actual flow, a wind of solar uh, particles, ionized protons, electrons uh, coming in, uh, at supersonic speeds, this highly distorts this environment, and one gets the uh, the kind of configuration. This is uh, this is sort of a, an Earth-type magnetosphere, but we have this kind of magnetosphere, but with greater tilt, uh, with the rotation axis also in this direction rather than in this direction as at Earth. So, where at Earth, this cones around like this uh, as the magnetic axis goes around the rotation axis at. Uh, Uranus, we're getting a coning like this as we're going around the magnetic axis, and this has uh, a great effect on this tail region, magnetic tail region, where, as you can see, magnetic lines of force that come out of one pole uh, have a, a, a polarity away from the planet, and, and in the other part of the tail, as they're coming into the other pole, they have the opposite polarity. In between this, there is a sheet or slab of energized particles called the plasma sheet. And we're seeing that on Uranus, but whereas on the Earth, uh, this sheet, as the pole, magnetic pole, cones around the rotation axis, this sheet wobbles like this in the tail, or with the axis going mm -hmm. the, down mm -hmm. the tail. On Uranus, it's actually going to be going around like this. Completely so it's very rotating. different, and we've seen three crosses through this, and we're really? just now starting to look at the data. Unfortunately, we didn't stay in the tail any longer than that. At 7 o'clock this morning, we... Uh, Greenwich time, we went out through the boundary of the tail, and we're now on our way uh, away from the planet and the magnetosphere, but uh, we have plenty of data to provide us with additional excitement and, uh, and pleasure over the next few months. And this, of course, also means that the various trapped radiation that is accompanies a magnetic field is going to be all swinging around. And yes, there's, uh, there's going, very it's, it's a pattern. completely unique uh, planet, and uh, that's uh, a, a wonderful way to uh, sort of cap off this part of uh, a long mission, and uh, of course we still have Neptune to go, but I think uh, Uranus is, is providing us with things all beyond our expectations, uh, a great deal of excitement. Well, thank you very much for joining okay. us. Sometimes with our technology advanced so far, we tend to lose sight of the enormity of a mission such as this. For, for instance, Voyager 2 has been on the road, so to speak, 
for eight and a half years. Eight and a half years traveling at speeds averaging 40,000 miles an hour or so. To put that in perspective, well, do you remember what you were doing in 1977, the year Voyager 2 began this journey? David Sparks recalls what some people were doing. Let's return to the year 1977. The year Voyager 2 was launched from Cape Canaveral aboard a mighty Titan rocket. It left behind a world that desperately needed a lift of its own, a positive frontier. And as it broke the sky, the promise of such an era was born. In January of 1977, Jimmy Carter, dressed in a three-piece suit, became the 39th president of the United States as he took the oath of office with his vice presidential running mate, Walter Mondale. As the Voyager 2 mission was given birth, 1977 brought death for a pioneer of space, Dr. Werner von Braun. The silver screen lost Joan Crawford, Bing Crosby, Freddie Prinze, Groucho Marx, and his brother Gummo. And gum chewers worldwide lost one of their favorite sons, Philip K. Wrigley passed away. A 10-year moratorium on the death penalty was lifted when convicted killer Gary Gilmore was executed. And in an ultimate irony, Eli Lilly, king of drugs, died. And Elvis Presley, king of rock and roll, died of drugs. In the entertainment news, the Academy Award for Best Picture went to Annie Hall. Incidentally, Star Wars came in second in the voting. We all witnessed Roots, Alex Haley's television miniseries, and Gone with the Wind was shown on network television for the very first time. In the news were such world figures as Anwar Sadat, still alive, calling Muammar Gaddafi that very strange person. Indira Gandhi was still with us and was defeated in a national election for India's lower house of parliament. The Shah of Iran was still in power. While Voyager 2 was breaking away from Earth's gravitational pull, Mother Earth showed a macabre reticence to let go her bond. A total of 581 persons died as a result of the world's worst aviation crash when two Boeing 747s collided in the Canary Islands. The son of Sam Killer was caught, G. Gordon Liddy was granted early parole, H.R. Haldeman and John Mitchell were jailed, and Dr. Martin Luther King's killer, James Earl Ray, escaped. Patty Hearst was placed on probation. In 1977, Saccharin was banned, and the Marshall Tucker Band had a gold album. And finally, in sports, the Yankees beat the Dodgers in the World Series, and the Oakland Raiders won their first ever Super Bowl against the Minnesota Vikings right here in Pasadena in the Rose Bowl. I'm David Sparks. A little bit like the Super Bowl. That gives you an idea of how long Voyager has been on its journey. It began that journey in 1977, the year all those events took place. Ed Stone, the Voyager project scientist, has joined us again. Ed, let's talk a moment about the events that took place today and try to put them in some sort of context with, this, with the whole Voyager Uran at least the Uranus portion of the mission. Uh, there's a lot happened today. Uh, but we, we've dwelt pretty much on the photographs of Miranda, which are so spectacular, you can't avoid doing that. Mm -hmm. And then that great picture of the material coming through the rings. But uh, what about the rest of the experiments? Is, we're, we're filled with particle experiments and radio, radio signals coming out? That's right. Well, we did, the, uh, did uh, discover radio signals about a week ago now, and uh, we're in the process of analyzing those, especially as we got behind the planet. Part of the uh, difficulty that the fields and particles experimenters have had is they're just now getting their data from the time that they, uh, the spacecraft was in occultation. It came in just this afternoon, and the second part of it comes in tomorrow morning. So I think we'll begin to see their story in more detail. There is one interesting thing that's already turned up, though, is that the, with the cosmic ray instrument, it was possible to look at the particles trapped in this very peculiar magnetic mm -hmm. field that's been mm -hmm. discussed. Uh, and uh, once the orientation of the magnetic field was properly taken into, a, into account, it was very clear that the moons in orbit around Uranus have absorbed, this made, this absorbed significant quantities of the energetic particles. And Would that affect their surface appearance? That could affect their surface appearance, exactly. The, uh, there are enough protons there that if there is methane on the surface, it would have changed the methane to, to a black material. The other interesting thing is we penetrated just inside of Miranda's orbit in the, in the magnetic sense, and w in there we found a very intense radiation environment, which we just barely nicked, and then we moved back out again. And so, in fact, we have not penetrated the most intense part of the uranium magnetosphere. It remains to be yet to be discovered. And this was significantly larger than just outside of Miranda? Yes, that's right. There was a distinct change in the intensity as we across the, the magnetic field that was associated with Miranda's orbit. The mm -hmm. intensity started increasing quite dramatically, reached a peak, 
and then we then we moved back out away from the planet and the intensity went back down again as if miranda's orbit was some sort of a barrier that's right exactly that miranda had absorbed part the particles were produced inside near the planet diffuse out toward uh, outward and then they run into miranda and miranda essentially absorbs them what about the radio signals that uh, dr scarf uh, picks up and has made such beautiful records of the sound of Saturn, the sound of Jupiter. Is he getting data here? Mm -hmm. Yes, in sound fact, of he's, he had some very interesting sounds uh, from the, uh, the ring plane crossing, just as at Saturn. What he uh, recorded was a, uh, were all the, mic the small dust particles hitting the spacecraft, and that generates electrical signal. And uh, he, uh, he, met, he heard these electrical signals, and uh, for a period of about, as I recall, it amounted to a distance of about 2,000 uh, kilometers. The uh, uh, the other radio signals that we heard as, as as we came in that gave us our first hint that there was a magnetic field there. I presume they're still that we're still picking. Those yes, up. we're still picking them up. Although we're still waiting for this data, uh, which oh. has just been played back. Uh, we hope that we can use the radio signals though to look for a periodicity so that we can, for the first time, determine what the period of the planet is. You see, we have measured the winds, and we know that they take about so, about uh, 16 hours or so to circulate around the planet. But we don't know how rapidly the interior of the planet is rotating. That's where the magnetic field is generated. And if we can somehow measure the rate at which the magnetic field is rotating, we can, for the first time, know how, how rapidly the planet is rotating. We've also, of course, with the UV instrument, been looking for any signs of air glow or aurora. What, what's come out from that so far? Well, there was this discovery of this new phenomena called electroglow, which is neither an aurora nor an air glow. Aurora is caused by particles coming out of the magnetotail or the magnetosphere and, and mm -hmm. incident on the uh, atmosphere causing it to glow. Northern lights. Northern lights. The air glow is just, is just sunlight causing the atmosphere to glow. Mm -hmm. In this case, we have a combination of the two where you need sunlight, but you also need energetic electrons. And the two together give this new phenomenon. Very good. Thank you, Ed. We'll see you tomorrow, and, and I think we'll have another update from you, and I appreciate uh, everything you've been able to tell us. And this sort of sums it up for today. We're waiting now for tomorrow, and still more excitement. We hope you'll be with us again when we look at more of the Voyager spacecraft's encounter with the planet Uranus. Good night. I'm Al Hibbs.